Hello. This podcast is a brief introduction into the anatomy of the proximal anatomy of the proximal aorta and its branches, which supply the head, neck, thorax, and upper limbs. This podcast will cover the course of the aorta within the thorax and the structure of its branches, supplying the upper body using both schematic and photographic diagrams. Some common variations of the aorta and its branches that may be encountered in clinical practice will also be discussed. The aorta is responsible for supplying oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. The first part, the ascending aorta, starts immediately distal to the aortic valve and provides the paired coronary arteries very early in its course. The aorta initially ascends posterior to the pulmonary trunk but passes anterior to the right pulmonary artery as it ascends further within the mediastinum. The anatomical ascending aorta ends just posterior to the sternal angle in the transthoracic plane. After this point, it continues as the arch of the aorta. The arch ascends superiorly, posteriorly and slightly to the left. It crosses in front of the trachea and reaches its apex to the left of the trachea and esophagus. It then descends further to end in the transverse thoracic plane. Beyond this point, it continues inferiorly as the descending aorta which passes posterior to the hilum of the left lung and primarily supplies the abdomen. Typically, the arch of the aorta provides three branches to supply the upper body and head. The largest and most proximal branch is the brachiocephalic trunk. This arises posterior to the manubrium and ascends about 4 cm superiorly and to the right, crossing in front of the trachea as it does so. It bifurcates into two terminal branches as it reaches the level of the sternal end of the right clavicle, the common carotid artery which travels superiorly into the neck, and the right subclavian artery which travels laterally towards the right upper limb. The brachiocephalic trunk is absent on the left side. Instead, the two branches arise separately from the arch of the aorta. The common carotid artery arises as the second branch of the arch and ascends along the left border of the trachea within the superior mediastinum. It then enters the neck behind the left sternoclavicular joint and ascends within the carotid sheath. It offers no branches until reaching the upper border of the thyroid cartilage. Here, it terminally bifurcates into the internal carotid artery posteriorly, which supplies intracranial tissues, and the external carotid artery anteriorly, which supplies the neck, visceral cranium, and the scalp. The left subclavian artery is the third and final branch of the aortic arch. It ascends superiorly, laterally, and slightly posteriorly towards the proximal left clavicle. From there, its course mirrors that of the right subclavian artery as it extends towards the left shoulder, lying behind the clavicle and the subclavian vein. The subclavian artery also passes behind the anterior scalene muscle, which inserts onto the first rib. As shown by this lateral view from the left, the subclavian artery, together with the roots of the brachial plexus, passes in between the anterior and posterior scalene muscles. This landmark is called the scalene hiatus. Note that the subclavian vein passes anterior to the anterior scalene. The subclavian artery can be divided into three parts based on its relationship with the anterior scalene. The first part from its origin to the medial border of the anterior scalene, the second part passing behind the muscle, and the third part from the lateral border of the anterior scalene to the lateral border of the first rib, beyond which it continues as the axillary artery. The subclavian artery is traditionally described to have four branches, and these mainly come off the first and second parts. The first branch to come off the first part of the subclavian artery is the vertical artery. This enters the transverse foramen of the C6 vertebra and ascends to C1, giving branches to the neck muscles and spinal cord as it does so. After entering the cranium through the foramen magnum, it unites with the contralateral vertebral artery to form the basilar artery, which contributes to the circle of Willis. The second branch of the subclavian artery usually arises from its inferior aspect. This is the internal thoracic artery, which descends along the anterior thoracic wall to supply various tissues. Notable branches are the pericardiacophrenic and the first six anterior intercostal arteries. It terminally bifurcates at the sixth intercostal space to form the musculophrenic and superior epigastric arteries. Therefore, the internal thoracic artery supplies the anterior wall of the thorax and abdomen, as well as the respiratory apparatus. The third branch, the thyrocervical trunk, supplies the neck and scapular regions through four branches. The neck viscera is supplied by the medially projecting inferior thyroid artery. The ascending cervical artery ascends anterior to the transverse processes of cervical vertebrae and supplies the lateral muscles of the upper neck as well as the lateral aspect of the spinal cord. There are two lateral branches. The suprascapular artery travels along the superior aspect of the clavicle towards the posterior scapula. The transverse cervical artery also travels laterally but at a higher level. In around 40% of the population, it bifurcates. This provides a superficial branch which travels superimedially and supplies the trapezius, sternocleidomastoid and levator scapulae muscles. The second limb is the deep branch of the transverse cervical artery which descends along the back to supply the superficial extrinsic back muscles, 
In the remaining 60% of patients, this deep branch is equally likely to arise independently from either the middle or the final third of the subclavian artery. In these cases, the independent branch is termed the dorsal scapular artery. The final branch of the subclavian artery is typically the costal cervical trunk. This short trunk projects posterior immediately behind the apex of the lung and provides two arteries. The deep cervical artery ascends behind the transverse processes of cervical vertebrae and supplies the deep paraspinal muscles of the cervical region. Upon reaching the superior aspect of the occipital triangle in the neck, the deep cervical artery anastomoses with the descending branch of the occipital artery. The trunk also provides a superior intercostal artery, which supplies the first two intercostal spaces posteriorly via a branch to each space. This concludes our podcast as we have covered the branching pattern of the aorta as well as the primary branches of the subclavian artery. In my next video, I discuss the anatomical variation of the structure of the aortic arch as has been described here. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe and leave a comment for feedback on how I can improve future videos. If you have any questions regarding this video, feel free to leave that in the comments as well and I will reply as soon as possible. Thank you.